So what occurs when I add a hydride reagent to a carboxylic acid? Well, as it turns out, carboxylic acids are not as reactive as acyl chlorides. That's because this OH here is not as good of a leaving group as a Cl. Thus, if you treat a carboxylic acid with sodium borohydride, nothing happens. In other words, sodium borohydride is not a strong enough source of H- hydride to touch a carboxylic acid. So what do we do? We have to use this reagent, lithium aluminum hydride, which is an extremely reactive source of H-. It's much more potent than sodium borohydride. This slide shows the mechanism traversed when I add lithium aluminum hydride to a carboxylic acid. I really don't want you to focus on the mechanism. I just want you to see that when I take a carboxylic acid and I react it with lithium aluminum hydride, lithium aluminum hydride ultimately adds two H minuses into the carbonyl carbon and takes me all the way down to the primary alcohol. Just as when I react an acyl chloride with sodium borohydride, when I treat a carboxylic acid with lithium aluminum hydride, two hydrides get added into that carbonyl carbon and take me all the way down to the primary alcohol. I also want you to remember that sodium borohydride is not a potent enough source of hydride to reduce a carboxylic acid. In order to reduce a carboxylic acid, I have to use lithium aluminum hydride, which is really an extremely potent source of hydride. So let's now ask, do you think that sodium borohydride will reduce an ester? Well, you might realize that esters having this OCH3 are similar to carboxylic acids. They aren't like an acyl chloride, which has a Cl that's a much better leaving group. So they are also not as reactive as an acyl chloride. What does that mean? Well, it means that sodium borohydride, once again, will not touch an ester usually. So I have to get out the big guns, lithium aluminum hydride, in order to reduce an ester. Just as with a carboxylic acid, lithium aluminum hydride pumps in two hydride atoms to take me all the way to a primary alcohol. It does it by this mechanism. An H- comes into this carbonyl, thrusting the electrons onto this oxygen, giving me this tetrahedral intermediate. This minus charge comes down to form a double bond and kicks off the OCH3, giving me this aldehyde. Unfortunately, I can't stop at the aldehyde. A second molecule of lithium aluminum hydride will then throw in a second hydride pump these electrons up here and give me this intermediate. This then gets quenched to go all the way to the primary alcohol. So once again, esters and acyl chlorides and carboxylic acids undergo two successive reactions with hydride to form a primary alcohol. You cannot reduce esters and carboxylic acids using sodium borohydride. You have to use the more reactive lithium aluminum hydride. So what if I have an ester and I only want to reduce it to an aldehyde instead of going all the way to a primary alcohol? Can I do anything about that? Do I have to enlist the help of magical leprechauns? Well, no. What I do is I use this reagent, diisobutyl aluminum hydride, commonly referred to as dibol or dibol H. Di, ball, dibol. When I stir an ester at negative 78 degrees Celsius with dibol, followed by water quench, I can selectively only add in one hydride, kick off this OCH3 to stop at the aldehyde, rather than going all the way down to the primary alcohol. Isn't that cool? I mean, I know we're probably not going to declare a national holiday over it or anything, but I still think it's pretty neat. Let's go back now to lithium aluminum hydride, but this time we're going to focus on amides. You see, when we react an amide with lithium aluminum hydride, a slightly different product is formed, a primary amine, shown here. The mechanism here shows how that occurs. Once again, I don't want you to worry too much about the mechanism. I just want you to remember that lithium aluminum hydride 
converts carboxylic acids and esters all the way to primary alcohols, but in contrast will convert amides down to amines. On a personal note, I just have to tell you how crappy working with lithium aluminum hydride really is. The reason is because it's so stinking reactive. Frequently, uh, these reactions will bubble over when you quench them and start fire. That's why we have to quench them at negative 78 degrees Celsius. And even then, they frequently bubble over and catch fire. One day when I was working in uh, the lab during a, one of my previous jobs, a coworker of mine was slowly quenching a lithium aluminum hydride reaction. As frequently occurs, it bubbled over, spilling solvent over, all over the inside of her fume hood. She wiped up that solvent and then threw the paper towel into the trash can. Before we knew it, the trash can started on fire. I ran over to her workbench and grabbed the nearest fire extinguisher, only to realize that in the poorly equipped lab that I worked in at the time, our fire extinguisher was really only a decoration and didn't actually work. If they had painted a picture of a fire extinguisher on the wall, it would have been just as effective. Fortunately, another coworker of mine grabbed a different fully functional fire extinguisher that we had and put out the blaze. It was scary, but I'm pleased to report that there were no fatalities, other than my underpants, which had to be destroyed. One other awful thing about lithium aluminum hydride reactions is that when you quench them, they usually smell like poo, much like the underpants of anyone nearby when you start a garbage can on fire in the lab. Because sodium borohydride, lithium aluminum hydride, and hydrogen with palladium carbon all have different reactivities toward different functional groups, we can tailor reaction conditions sele to selectively affect, in some instances, only certain parts of the molecule. For example, if I started with this molecule, which you'll notice has a ketone, an alkene, and an ester in it, I can selectively affect only certain parts of this molecule using different conditions. For example, you might remember that sodium borohydride will only reduce ketones and will not reduce esters, and it also will not reduce alkenes. Thus, if I take this material and I treat it with sodium borohydride, it will only reduce the ketone, converting it into a secondary alcohol, and will not touch the ester or the alkene. Separately, if I were to take this starting material and treat it with hydrogen, with palladium, or platinum, the palladium and platinum would hydrogenate or reduce the alkene only. It would not touch the ketone and would not touch the ester. Thus, I could selectively just reduce the alkene. In contrast, if I treat this starting material with lithium aluminum hydride, which is my most potent source of H-, it will reduce both the ketone and the ester, but will not touch the alkene. This will ultimately give me this product. This is very useful information to know when you want to uh, divergently convert a product into multiple, or a starting material, into multiple different products without affecting all of the different portions of the molecule. As you can well imagine, treating a ketone or an aldehyde with a cyanide nucleophile causes a reaction mechanism to occur that's very similar to treating a ketone or aldehyde with hydride, Grignard, or an acetylide. The cyanide nucleophile will come into the carbonyl carbon, thrust these electrons onto the O- and give me this tetrahedral intermediate. Once this is quenched with acid, in this case hydrogen cyanide acid, it gives me this kind of intermediate, which is really cool. I have an alcohol that's on a carbon adjacent to a nitrile. Now this feels like a great place for us to end. Please take a quick break and rest your herniated eardrums. I look forward to seeing you shortly for our final and concluding lecture of Chapter 18.